Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to the second week of the 2017 Digital Classes London seminar series. This week, it's a very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Donald Sturgeon from Harvard University, who is going to talk to us about crowdsourcing a digital library of pre-modern Chinese. Donald? Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, Let's see, how do we get to screen? Uh, the green button. The green button. Okay. Um, and then you... Great. Okay, thanks very much. So, um, thanks everyone for coming and thanks for organizing this session. Um, I'm going to be talking about my experiences with crowdsourcing a digital library for pre-modern Chinese texts. Um, this is the background to this is a project that I've been running since 2005 called the Chinese Text Project. Um, it's an online archive. Uh, it's open access. And I should em emphasize for those of you who are not um, focusing on Chinese studies or who don't have a background in Chinese, that all of the interface and all of the um, explanations that are available online are also available in English. So if you go to this web address, you'll find um, explanations and an interface in English, and it's actually designed to be something which can be usable by people whose native language is not Chinese, people who are just starting to learn Chinese and so on. So uh, you don't need to be um, fluent in Chinese to use this project. So I'm going to introduce a little bit about the project itself and give some examples, and then mainly focus on the preparation and curation of data. So this is going to involve optical character recognition for Chinese texts and crowdsourcing for maintaining this body of data. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about something which has been developed relatively recently for this project, which is an application programming interface, or API. And this is really done to allow two key things. First of all, integration between this project and other projects, particularly online resources, online tools. Uh, and secondly, for data mining access for people who want to do digital humanities studies, big data studies, who want to do some sort of textual analysis on these materials. So the main contents and functionality of the site, I'm not going to go through the whole um, thing. The things which are most important for today are that its main contents include page images of pre-modern Chinese works, so scanned uh, versions of the entire texts, uh, and transcriptions of the contents of these texts. And the site itself provides what you could think of as a digital reading environment for working with these materials. And the primary focus of this is on handwritten texts and block printed texts, ranging from the earliest transmitted texts from the Chinese tradition uh, through to early 20th century works. So the types of thing that we're talking about are things like this. This is an example page image from the Harvard Yenjing Rare Books Collection digitization project. Uh, and this is an example of the kind of transcription we have in this case of the same work. Uh, these two things in many cases, in most cases, are tied together. So we have these two different representations, but they're linked in certain ways that I'll give examples of in a moment. But these are the basic types of material we're talking about. And this is how the actual user interface looks. If you use the English user interface, this is a typical page from uh, the section on classical texts. Uh, you'll see that we have English translations for some of these texts, and these are aligned at a paragraph level, uh, which makes it quite easy for people who may not be fluent in Chinese to work with these materials. The main thing I want to draw attention to here regarding the interface is that we have a lot of functionality that's tied to these materials at a paragraph level. So you'll see beside a paragraph of text like this on the left, you have these various icons, and each of these do various things with this particular paragraph of material. So this, the blue one, for example, uh, gives this closer side-by-side -side aligned translation and original Chinese source text aligned not at the uh, paragraph level but at the phrase level uh, and also includes functions like a dictionary pop-up system which makes it very easy to analyze the relationship between these two things. Another example is information about text reuse relationships in this particular passage of text versus the rest of the classical corpus and other things include classical commentary displays. So in this case, we're looking at part of the text from this particular paragraph cited in the large characters here, and the small characters are commentaries from a traditional commentary on that particular text. Uh, probably the most important feature 
as regards what I'm talking about today, is that for the majority of these texts, we have links between this transcribed version of the text and the scanned representation. So there's user interface element which switches between these two views. And so for any piece of the text that somebody's actually reading or interested in, they can quickly jump to this side-by-side -side image and transcription view which shows the actual source for this particular transcription. And this is very important in the crowdsourcing and OCR because this makes it possible to verify the accuracy of any of these materials. And as you can see in the specific example, uh, there's a search term highlighted. If you search in the transcribed version, you can immediately see on which page line and column of the scan source does the corresponding text appear. So the scope of this project has expanded quite a lot. It began in 2005. And it now has around 25,000 users every day. Uh, it has 25 million pages of this type of scan material. And uh, over 8,000 registered contributors who help in various ways with the development of the project. And if we look at this by region, perhaps unsurprisingly, the vast majority of our users are actually based in the greater China region. So primarily China, also Taiwan and Hong Kong account for more than 80% of our user base. So as you would expect, we also have an interface which is in uh, Chinese. We also have simplified Chinese, which is uh, commonly used in mainland China. So there are different ways of accessing the project depending on the actual users themselves. The change that I want to highlight in this today is a change that took place in 2013, which is from what I'm going to term a static database approach to a dynamic approach to curating this content. And what I have in mind here is that this project was originally conceived as a fairly traditional type of centrally edited database project, which is a very common approach, uh, but has transformed itself into something which is much more similar in principle to Wikipedia, Wikisource, and so on, and is now maintained primarily using crowdsourcing. So the reasons for this relate to the challenges and opportunities of digitization, and in particular, the fact that scanning books, scanning these types of historical materials is relatively speaking fast and cheap. It's a mechanical process, it's well understood. The costs for infrastructural components like storage and image processing are exponentially decreasing. And there are also other reasons why people want to scan these materials besides putting them into this type of database system. For example, libraries will frequently want to scan and preserve these uh, rare and unique objects because this allows people to interact with the images of them rather than having to go and consult the physical fragile objects in every case. So because of this, we have large-scale scanning projects for this type of material. The Harvard Engineering Rare Books Collection, which I'm particularly familiar with, has already scanned over 5 million pages of this type of stuff, all of which is included in this project. But there are even larger projects than that in China, scanning even larger volumes of material, which of course is great. But unfortunately, manually transcribing the contents of any of these books is an extremely slow and costly process. And most, virtually all of these materials, these pre-modern texts, lack the kind of contents and index pages that we'd expect in modern works. And so they're actually, in many cases, very cumbersome to navigate. It's very difficult to locate material within them, even if you know it occurs somewhere within them, where we may, may be talking about something which is tens of thousands of pages long. So what we would like are transcriptions, and one way to hopefully get these is using optical character recognition, which is, relatively speaking, fast and cheap. Again, it's a mechanical process, and it only relies on computer processing time to complete. But the results are imperfect. Even though they're imperfect, they can still be useful. Probably a good example of this is the Google Books project, where an enormous amount of material has been scanned and OCR'd. If you know that something occurs in one of these texts, you may be able to find it on Google using their OCR search interface, even though the results uh, include large numbers of errors. If we can have more accurate OCR, though, we can actually start using the OCR as a basis for manually post-correcting these texts. And obviously, this is a huge project if we're talking about tens of millions of pages of material. So just to make this a bit more explicit, I want to contrast these two approaches to maintaining this type of material. So the first approach is the static approach. So this is what I think of as the traditional database building approach. It's very clearly related to the traditional scholarly publishing model. And this is basically a step-by-step -step process, one step after the other. We start out with transcription, um, probably manual, could be by OCR, followed by a stage of correction, 
followed by punctuation, annotation in various ways specific to whatever project we're talking about. And eventually, once the material has been successfully processed, it's been through all these stages and it's essentially finalized, then it can be ingested into a database system. And once it's in the database system, it can be used in whatever ways the database system provides for. What I'm terming the dynamic approach basically consists of exactly the same steps, but in a different order. Uh, the first stage, again, is to transcribe the material. And in this case, I'm thinking particularly using optical character recognition. Uh, but then immediately ingest this into some sort of system. And the reason for doing this right at the start is that it can then start to be used in the same way as the material in Google Books can be used to facilitate search of the material. Uh, but together with its use, it can simultaneously be corrected, it can be punctuated, it can be annotated in whatever ways are required for this particular body of material. And the key contrast that I want to draw between these two approaches is the sections highlighted here in yellow during which work is being done, but the results of this work are essentially unavailable to users. They're unavailable to people who are not directly affiliated with the project and don't have access to the internal procedures and current state of it. And this is significant because in the static model, this long pipeline here is an extremely slow and expensive process. If we're talking about the volumes of data which are available for Chinese, so tens of millions of pages, slow here probably means something on the order of decades. This is a serious amount of time required to actually do this, even supposing we actually had the funding to do this in practice. Whereas by contrast, digitization using OCR is fast and cheap. So the actual ingest step of this process can be completed very quickly and immediately we can make use of the results we have and gradually improve them over time. So this is related to this idea of the long tail. Um, what I've got here is a chart. You can imagine this is of every text, every edition of every text in Chinese history that we have access to, or that we have scanned versions of. If we plot these according to popularity, frequency of use, how mainstream these texts are, you can imagine at the left-hand side of this graph, we would have the most mainstream texts, the most common things, the things which were very early, very uh, quickly digitized early on at the beginning of digitization. People spent large amounts of time inputting these by hand because these were such important texts that everyone wanted access to. And as you move to the right-hand side of this graph, you'll see things which will continue to be digitized in the near future. But the key feature of this is what's left over. In other words, the long tail. Everything else which has not been considered sufficiently important, sufficiently mainstream, has not attracted funding to actually be hand transcribed in this way, unless we use something like OCR or, or some type of crowdsourcing system, a lot of this material remains relatively inaccessible because at most we only have these scanned page images and very few ways of navigating them. So this change in uh, amount of material which can be digitized is reflected in the history of a specific project. Uh, if we plot, just as a simple example, the number of texts which have been included in the Chinese text project since it started in 2005 up to 2017. If you look at this graph here, it looks like absolutely nothing happened from 2005 to 2013. Um, in fact, you can only make sense of what's going on here if you change to a log scale. Uh, during the time period from 2005 to 2013, hundreds of texts had in fact been added to this database. But using the traditional static approach, that's something which takes an enormous amount of effort and proceeds very slowly. And you can see as soon as we changed to this dynamic model in 2013, quickly hundreds became thousands and tens of thousands of texts. And looking at the trend in this graph, it seems plausible that in the next few years, this will increase into hundreds of thousands of texts and additions of texts in the system. And similarly, my task will do, it. do many people actually make use of this material once it's added. You can also see an exponential growth in terms of users uh, starting from 2013. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about how we actually get the data into the project in the first place, so how we get these transcriptions from the images. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the details because some of these details are very specific to Chinese, but I think quite a lot of the general approaches can be adapted to other domains also. And the first of these is domain-specific image processing. So the basic idea of this is, as a first step towards OCR, take the page images and perform certain types of image processing specific to the particular kinds of images that we're dealing with to attempt to simplify the problem for the OCR system. 
So to try and remove anything which we don't want our OCR system to attempt to recognize as being characters from the image itself, so that the OCR system is never actually presented with this information. Uh, second type is domain-specific character segmentation, and I'll give examples of all of these in a moment. Um, this is useful because we can leverage specific features of the class of text that we're actually dealing with. So we know certain things about the text we're dealing with. For example, in this case, most trivially, we know that they're written in Chinese. We know certain features about the Chinese language, the way it's written, and we can take advantage of these to effectively exclude impossible cases from being considered by our OCR engine. And lastly, we can train an OCR engine using actual historical data. In other words, train a system by giving it examples of what every single character looks like in the particular types of text that we're interested in. And if we can do this, this again increases the recognition accuracy because our OCR engine knows exactly what it should be expecting to see. So the first example is really a very simple one. Um, this is just an example of binarization. So the reason for doing this is that the majority of mainstream OCR engines ultimately operate on black and white images. But the images that we have as our input images are full color ones in many cases, like this high quality scan from the Harvard Engineering Rare Books collection. And there are various parts of the binarization process which we can adapt to our specific texts in ways which will help us increase OCR accuracy. So you might think that this is a very trivial process, and certainly it's easy enough to transform this image on the left into a pure black and white image. Uh, using any of any of many different programs. Uh, if you do that, typically what you'll get is an image like the one on the right here, which generally looks fine apart from the bottom right corner, where you can see that what has been actually a seal stamped on this particular page image on the left in red, in fact, this is a Harvard Engineering Rare Books Collection seal, uh, has been merged into the layer of text. So we have effectively two layers of different text superimposed on one another on the right-hand side here. And this is what the OCR engine is going to be seeing and what it's going to be dealing with. And if it attempts to recognize this image, there's almost no probability of it getting this section of the uh, image correct. It's going to be confused by these two text layers merged together. And one very simple example of what we can do to leverage domain knowledge in this case is to say, well, in the images we're dealing with, Almost always what we're dealing with is black text on various colored backgrounds and very frequently we'll have this kind of seal or other material superimposed typically in red on top of them. We can actually adapt our image processing pipeline so that this layer of information disappears before the OCR engine attempts to process the page. So this is a very simple example of how we can actually improve accuracy in practice by leveraging things we know about the specific domain. Uh, another slightly more sophisticated example involves developing algorithms which can actually remove information from the image which commonly occurs but which cannot plausibly be something we want to recognize. And the idea here looking at this image is if we look closely there are a bunch of things on this page which do not correspond to content which we actually want to recognize in practice. Uh, the first of these is this column of text or half column of text on the far left here, which is a frequent uh, result of the digitization process and prior copying pr processes of Chinese text of this particular variety. This contains fragments of characters, which are therefore not going to be recognizable by an OCR engine, and therefore, at best, they'll be excluded, and at worst, they're going to result in large amounts of noise. Uh, but there are also all sorts of other things on this page which are not characters, and the more of these we can remove, the better chance our OCR engine is going to have of accurately recognizing things. So these include all of the lines uh, around the page and within the page, the dividing lines between columns, and so on. Basically anything which is not part of a character image. And again, we can make use of things that we know about this text, but which an off-the-shelf OCR program would not know about these texts. For example, uh, the plausible sizes of characters in this page. There's no possibility that there's going to be one enormous character taking up all of the page. That's not a possibility we want to consider. If we can get rid of all of these things on this basis and transform our image into something much cleaner like this with only text in it, then we've reduced the number of possibilities that our OCR engine has to consider. And in practice, this results in significantly better recognition regardless of the OCR software. And we can also take this kind of idea further. Uh, once we've removed all of these lines and extraneous information from our images, we can actually perform the character segmentation ourselves. Uh, 
In the Chinese case, this makes use of the fact that we're expecting columnar layouts like this, and that we're expecting, after having removed these lines, that there'll be significant white space between each column. So we can actually recognize these columns ourselves. Uh, and in fact, by leveraging this knowledge, we can actually get better segmentation accuracy than most OCR software is capable of doing on its own. Uh, we can also, in the Chinese case, take this idea down to the character segmentation level. Again, we know certain things about these texts which an OCR engine may not know. Uh, and we can use similar algorithms looking for white space, but also taking into account plausible character sizes, plausible character dimensions, and aspect ratios to extract these uh, individual images automatically before we even start talking about recognizing them. And there are difficult cases for Chinese, particularly in handwritten texts. Uh, but these are all things which leveraging domain knowledge can actually allow us to perform slightly better than a typical OCR engine would be able to do on these things. The last of the three things I mentioned, training with historical image data, is harder for Chinese than for most languages because we're talking about thousands and thousands of distinct characters. So most OCR software operates on a character level, and in order to retrain an OCR engine to recognize the type of writing that we're interested in, what's required are images of every single possible character together with labels saying, well, which character is this an image of? And this is something which for languages with small character sets, it may be feasible to collect manually, simply by going through a few pages of a book and manually labeling each of the characters we want to use as training data. Uh, but for Chinese texts, this is not practical. Uh, instead, what we do is to automatically align large amounts of transcribed data with page images that we already have. So we can, for the Chinese case, leverage OCR software, which works to some degree for these texts uh, by identifying the correspondences between the OCR results we get initially and the expected translation. So we attempt to align these two things and infer from this alignment which parts of our original image correspond to which characters. And if we do that successfully, then we end up with data like this, where we have one particular Chinese character and we have a bunch of different ways of writing it in the same writing style, but in different places in various texts. And because this can be performed as an unsupervised procedure, we can do this over and over again for thousands and thousands of different characters. And if we want to recognize a slightly different writing style of Chinese, we can repeat the whole process again with the different input data. So next, what I'm going to do is to perform a very, very small scale uh, analysis of accuracy on actual real historical data. So this is not really a, an adequate large scale analysis because I'm only going to look at one page of data, but I think this is helpful because it provides very concrete examples of where OCR goes wrong and how this procedure actually manages to do better than the baseline which we would get from other methods. So I'm going to use for this example a page of a Google Books image of a Chinese text. Uh, one of the reasons for doing that is that we can then immediately see what Google Books gets for it using their OCR procedure. And this is what they get for that image. And probably, even if you don't read Chinese, you can immediately see that this is not a great result. Uh, on the right-hand side here, this is the transcription extracted from Google Books. Uh, you'll see, first of all, there are only five columns of text here, whereas there are nine in the uh, actual scan itself. Uh, and I've highlighted in red the characters on Google Books transcription here, which are either incorrect because the, trans the character has been mistranscribed, or because the character doesn't appear in the image at all. Uh, in addition to all of these characters highlighted in red, though, uh, there are quite serious problems with missing data. So all of these parts that I've highlighted on the left here are things which should have been recognized, but there's no corresponding information in Google's transcription at all. So there's clearly a very high error rate in this transcription. Uh, we can try a different piece of OCR software. Uh, Abbey Fine Reader is quite a commonly used OCR program, and it does support traditional Chinese text. If we put the same image into it, uh, the corresponding result, result looks like this. Again, you can see there are some things that have been missed out, although not entire columns, and a fairly large number of characters have been mistranscribed, the ones written in red on the right-hand side here. Uh, another OCR engine is the open source Tesseract OCR engine, uh, which again has data for Chinese. Its result looks slightly better than Abby's. Uh, you can see there's 
a large column of noise on the far right here, which doesn't correspond to anything in the uh, original text. It's attempted to recognize most of the characters, but a fair number of them it is misrecognized. It's got the wrong result for. And lastly, this is the result which you get with the current procedure for ztext.org, the procedure we had a couple of years ago for ztext.org. Uh, and you can see, I think, straight away that the number of errors is significantly reduced on this one. Uh, we have, I think, 10 characters misrecognized, uh, but that's, that's about the extent of the mistakes on here. So once we have results like this, one of the things which we want to do, and of course, whenever I talk about OCR, people always ask me, what is the accuracy of your OCR engine? The reason for giving this very concrete example in a lot of detail is because I don't think it's meaningful to answer that question without a lot of qualification and without comparing like with like between different uh, OCR programs. So one way of thinking about OCR accuracy is in terms of error rate. So you can think of the error rate as basically being the number of characters that I highlighted in red on the previous images. In other words, how many characters are incorrect would have to be substituted to get the correct result from these outputs. How many insertions would I have to make to correct these outputs into the uh, corrected text? And how many things would I have to delete as a proportion of all of the characters that should be on the page? In other words, what percentage of the text would actually have to be corrected manually if we were starting out with one of these results and wanted to produce the correct result uh, as a final product? And if we do that, then we can simply think of accuracy as being 100% minus whatever this error rate is. So if we do that and compare it for these four different methods, you can see that the accuracy here varies wildly from 39% in Google Books up to 71% in Tesseract, which is the best uh, that we can do off the shelf with any of these OCR engines. But the domain adaptations that I've described so far actually take this up to 94% on the same image. So putting the time in to actually adapt the OCR to the domain really can make a significant change in terms of the quality of output that you can expect. Once we have this data, of course, there are a bunch of things you can do. Once you have transcriptions of page images, the first and the most obvious one is to implement full text search. So if you go to ctext, these are all screenshots from ctext, you'll see a full text search function like this. And if you perform it on one of these scanned image sequences, you'll get a result like this, where you have our transcription derived through OCR, your search term is highlighted within it, but you can also see the actual page image to verify whether that's correct and to see the context and so on. Uh, also, and this is one of the reasons why we're particularly concerned about noise and limiting the amount of noise. If we can limit the amount of noise within each page image, then it becomes feasible to actually join the pages together and get a full text transcription of entire works in a way that's actually readable without having to continually reference the page images themselves directly. Uh, so within ctext, these two different ways of working with the data are actually linked. They're really two different visualizations of one underlying representation. So the textual data is represented internally in some format, and it's visualized differently depending on whether we're looking at the side-by-side -side page image and transcription version, or whether we're simply working with the text in the normal uh, textual format. So effectively, the data about positional information on the scan is layered on top of this data here. So this red section here, for example, corresponds to this particular page of a much larger sequence of page images. This particular section corresponds to the first column, and so on. So this data is laid, layered on top of our primary representation of the data. One of the most important things about this side-by-side -side image and transcription view is that this makes it very easy for people to identify errors, and this is really where the crowdsourcing comes in. So what we want to do here is to encourage people to actually use this material, work with whichever representation is convenient for them, and help us through their use to identify and correct errors. And the way that works at the moment on the site is something like this. A user looks at this side-by-side -side representation, perhaps they want to cite something, perhaps they want to know whether the, the text really says this, and they identify an error like this one here, where in the scan version we have three lines, which is the Chinese for three, and on the right-hand side in the transcription we just have one line, which is the Chinese for one. So this is an error which we would want our users to correct, and on ctext the way this is corrected at the moment is by clicking this quick edit button, which pops up a simple 
transcription of just the content on this page. So this, in fact, is not actually the underlying representation of the data, but this is a representation of the data which is relatively easy for users to edit without necessarily having to understand what our internal representations look like. So this is simply a representation where each column of text has been transformed into a single line of text. So the user then submits their change and immediately this is applied to the underlying representation and therefore to all of the visualizations of this textual object at the same time. And as you'd probably expect, since this is a crowdsourcing project, there are various ideas borrowed from Wikipedia behind this. So the first of these, the most important, is the idea of an edit log. So this is a fully open crowdsourcing project. Anyone can go online and create an account and immediately change any of the texts in this database. So the first thing we need to know is who changed what and when, and that's what the edit log records. Each Entry in the edit log links, again, very much like Wikipedia, to a visualization of what actually changed at that point in time, what changes this particular editor made to this particular text. So this particular entry corresponds to the change I mentioned on the previous slide. You can see on the left-hand side, we have the one highlighted in red to indicate that was deleted, and on the right-hand side, the three is highlighted in green to indicate that was inserted at the same location. So we can see immediately what change this user actually made here. And most importantly, and the part which is actually very, very different from Wikipedia and where we're in a much better situation than Wikipedia, we can then link directly from this to the side-by-side -side scan and image representation of this text, which makes it very easy for any other user to, when faced with this edit log, verify whether or not this is actually a correct, valuable edit which should be saved and stored in the database. Because all you need to do to confirm it is to check whether or not these, this change from a one to a three corresponds to the same page of the scanned representation. There are lots of ways in which this general crowdsourcing idea can be taken forward. And of course, some of these are going to be domain specific. This is somewhat domain specific here. One of the problems we have with digitizing historical Chinese texts is the huge number of characters involved and the fact that because of this huge potential number of characters, many of these do not have representations in Unicode. So there's no way of typing these characters in. They have no representation in the standard uh, ways of representing characters. So one thing we can do to help with this is to implement task-specific visual editing tools that help our editors input this data in the way that we would like and recording whatever structural information we need about this a piece of data so that we can make use of it afterwards. So in this particular example, I've highlighted in red here um, a character which can't be input in Unicode. The task-specific editor, which we have for rare character input, involves the user, first of all, literally drawing with their mouse uh, a box around the particular character that we're talking about in the image, which is then automatically extracted in this interface, and then inputting a certain amount of basic metadata about this character. For example, about its composition, how many strokes it it has, and so on. And importantly, there's also a stage of this process which asks the user to check whether we already have seen this character anywhere else, whether this is the first attestation of it in this database, or whether it may be, for example, a character which they could have input in Unicode if they'd known how, or whether it's a, date, a character which somebody else has input elsewhere in some other text. And if so, they're asked to identify this as being the same one, and this information, together with everything else that the user's input, is then transformed into an XML representation of all of this data. And this XML representation can then be copied and pasted into the standard editing interface at exactly the location where this character should occur. So from a user perspective, what happens when you do that, first of all, is that the character appears on the right-hand side, represented as an image in this case. Uh, but also with this metadata stored behind it. And because the metadata is stored behind it, and because each character is assigned an identifier by the system as part of this process, it then becomes possible to use these characters also in the standard textual representation of these objects. And they also become searchable because they can be searched by the identifier, which is what you get when you copy and paste one of these things. This also allows us to collate the data which is crowdsourced from our users in this way. So for this particular character, you can see it occurs in more than one text. These will have been, these corrections may have been added by different users, uh, but because of this method of identifying the characters as part of the visual 
editing interface, uh, these characters can be matched together and can be treated by the system as being one uh, single character. So this allows us to collate the data, which effectively amounts to a justification of the usage of this character. So this catalogs the attested use of this character within our database. And this is something which anyone who wants to understand how this character is actually used is going to want to know. It's also the kind of data that would be required if in the future we want to make a proposal to the Unicode Consortium to add this character as a character which can be manipulated in the usual way. So the last thing I want to talk about is the application programming interface for this database. So first of all, the motivation for creating this is that this is now the largest full text database of pre-modern Chinese writing. Uh, but at the same time, it's not a static object. It changes literally every day, pretty much every hour of every day. Updates are being continually made. Texts are being added, texts are being punctuated, texts are being corrected. And at the same time, the majority of people are actually interested in some subset of this data. Most people are working on some particular texts or particular editions of particular texts. They always want the most accurate version available, but they don't necessarily need everything in the database all at the same time. And this is particularly true of people who make use of this crowdsourcing interface themselves purely for the purpose of creating an accurate textual transcription of a text which they actually need access to. You can actually use the uh, Chinese text project interface to correct your text and then immediately download it using the application programming interface. But this use case relies upon the API giving you access to the current version uh, as it is at this precise moment in time. Uh, there are also lots of different users of ctext and many people use it in different ways. So different use cases will have different requirements. Uh, people may want the data in different formats. Some people may just want the text as a flat file. They may only need the textual data. Some people may care about the structure of the text. People may want to use external dictionaries. If you're a Chinese user versus a user based in the UK, you may want to be using different types of dictionaries. So there are lots of different use cases and APIs can help with enabling these. So the API as a whole basically consists of three major components. The first are URNs, which simply are machine readable identifiers for one particular textual object. And in our case at the moment, these identify one specific, one specific edition of one particular text or one particular chapter of a particular edition of a particular text. The second component is a fairly conventional JSON API. So JSON is just the name of the machine readable language that the responses are returned in. And this allows other programs to access data from this project in a machine readable format so that the structure is maintained so that it can be manipulated easily in different programming languages. And this can include textual data, so the full text contents of these things, uh, but also metadata about the text themselves. And the third component, which is perhaps a little unusual, is a plugin system. Uh, the plugin system in this context is a way of allowing third parties to integrate their tools and projects within this system's user interface. So in practice, it works by allowing users to define their own XML descriptions of how to send certain types of information from this site into other sites or into other projects. And the goal with these is that they should be user definable, shareable, and can be automatically updated so that the maintenance of these things can be fully distributed. People don't need to apply for permission to CTEXT to go and write one of these. They can just write one, share it with their friends, and when they make changes to it, it can be updated for all of the users who make use of it. They're also designed to be usable by people who have no particular technical knowledge of APIs or XML or anything like this. Uh, so there's a point and click user interface for installing these things. Uh, they just display as a list here with information about them. And users who have accounts can install these into their accounts. In practice, all that means is that the XML content of the plugin is copied into their plugin file within the system. Uh, and it's also possible for third parties who have created plugins for their projects with CTEXT to have installation links from their own websites. So once a user has installed a plugin, uh, this is the kind of thing that it results in. So what we're looking at here is a dictionary entry from the dictionary within CTEXT. And this, the part that's highlighted in red here is the list of plugins which that particular user who's logged in at the moment uh, has installed. So each link in this list here is a plugin which they've installed. And 
In this case, these are dictionary plugins. So what these do are very simple. Uh, when accessing any particular dictionary entry on ctext, if you follow the dictionary plugin link for a particular plugin, that will take you to the corresponding entry in some external dictionary. And so what dictionaries these are, of course, is completely down to the user. Uh, you can define these yourself. You can use choose from the list of things which are already there. And this allows uh, for a lot of customization, which makes sense for our user base because people have different native languages. Also, some people will be academic users who have access to subscription-based uh, dictionaries. Other users may not. Not everyone wants the same list of resources. And also, it's important to mention that this is extensible, so this doesn't require uh, anyone associated with this particular project to maintain an exhaustive list of all the possible dictionaries of Chinese. The second type of plugin which is maybe more interesting is a textual plugin. And this is basically exactly the same idea, but extended to textual content. So in this case, the idea is that the user will be making use of the site. They'll be browsing some particular textual object, like this particular text, for example. And as they do, there will be links displayed to all of the plugins which they have installed in their account. The most simple plugin, which is almost trivial, is a plain text export function. Um, all this plugin does is to use the API to extract the textual content associated with this particular textual resource, display it in a web browser so that a user can copy and paste it, or download it as a file, or whatever else. One of the reasons for mentioning this seemingly trivial example, though, is that because this is a plugin, this is technically not part of the core framework of this platform. Rather, this is a simple JavaScript application which people can download and actually modify if they want to have their own full text export function which works in some different way. For example, if they want to export the content in a different format, like TEI, for example, that's something which can actually be done simply by modifying this plugin rather than requiring it to be centrally integrated into the project. Uh, other things include the Marcus link here. So this is a plugin which goes to a completely external project which allows for manual and automated markup of certain information within historical Chinese texts, particularly proper names and uh, phrases relating to specific time periods. So this is a completely separate project, but their, their project has a plugin for ctext, which allows you to take any textual object from here and immediately load it into their system and apply their tools to it. Uh, there's also a plugin called Text Tools, which performs various textual manipulation and analysis uh, tasks on full text Chinese material that's primarily designed for Chinese material will also work for other languages. Uh, for example, regular expressions, um, analyses of text reuse, automatic identification of it, and various kinds of visualization of the results that are obtained through this. So again, the key point about this is that it's extensible and other people can go and create their own plugins which can immediately integrate into this system. And the last thing I want to talk about, which is also related to the API, is the development of specialized modules for particular programming languages, uh, particularly Python. So we have a, a Python module for ctext, which is designed to make the same API easily accessible for people working in Python. And it does this by trying to further abstract from some of the implementation details of the API. So in other words, to make it as easy as possible within Python to do the typical types of tasks that people are likely to want to, to do with these texts, particularly for simple cases of text mining. And the key thing is that this can make use of this structural information which we have in this project <coughs> so that data arrives in a simple, consistent, and completely predictable format, regardless of which textual object was requested from the system. And data structures should follow standard Python conventions so that it becomes very easy to write programs using these things. If that works, then it means that we get programs which are trivial to rerun with other texts because changing a URN simply changes the textual object which your program is going to work on. And things should function ex as expected if you change the textual object to something else. And I should mention that there's nothing special about Python here. The reason that there is a Python module is because we're using Python quite extensively at Harvard for digital humanities teaching. And this is how we get our texts for uh, doing that with Chinese. So the first thing about this is that it makes it very, very easy to import data. And this is actually even more important in a classroom setting where you have people who are bringing their own devices. You have a mixture of Mac and PC. And 
we're talking here about uh, humanities students who don't have any background in programming or learning to program for the first time, but are working with Chinese materials as the uh, particular case in point. And by being able to access this material directly through an API, this avoids all sorts of uninteresting problems which we would otherwise encounter in the first few sessions. So things like fully qualified path names, how you specify the precise location of a particular file on your computer, which it turns out is different if you're using a PC versus a Mac. All these sorts of uninteresting questions that we don't want to spend time on, we can avoid if we get our data through API. Uh, and as I said in the last slide, data arrives in a consistent format, but we can also get a choice of format. Uh, by encoding structural information about the text and by having a Python module which understands the way these texts are represented in this particular project. And the upshot of this is that we spend less time doing data wrangling, less time doing the uninteresting manipulation of material to get just to stage one where we can start actually applying the techniques we want to work with. Uh, but at the same time, we don't need to limit ourselves to any specific pre-prepared examples because you can immediately change the URN and get any of these 30,000 texts to work with. Uh, and another important point is that if this allows us to have simpler programs which are more readable, then this also has uh, clear advantages for people who are learning to program for the first time. So I'm just going to give a couple of simple examples of very simple Python programs. Um, this is literally just a five-line Python program where the first line simply tells the system we're going to use the ctext project and the second one tells it to get some particular textual information in a particular format. So the key things I want to highlight are the URN here at the end which just identifies what the textual object is uh, and if we change this textual object the program will simply operate it'll do exactly the same thing on a different object. So in this particular example all we're doing is looking for parts of the text which match some particular regular expression. If we change the URN, this program will do exactly the same thing, but it'll apply it to a different piece of text. And the other important thing about this is the function that's used. So we can have different functions, all of which operate on URNs, but which return the textual information in different formats or in different structures. So if we're dealing with regular expressions, we may just want the whole text as one very long list of characters, uh, in other words, as a string. But for other use cases, we can also request it in different formats. For example, we can request it as a list of paragraphs, as we do here. Uh, and this makes it possible to very easily apply in very short programs relatively sophisticated techniques, which otherwise would take quite a lot more preparation, particularly of the data and getting it into the correct form. So this is a very simple program which produces a simple form of social network analysis of the proper names that are mentioned in the text of the analytes, for example. And it's very easy to see how this program would be modified to work with any of the other texts uh, contained within this database system. The last example that I'm going to mention briefly is obviously too small to read. Um, the reason I put it on the slide is because this is the complete program. So what I want to emphasize is that it's not a hugely long program, but it does perform something quite sophisticated, uh, which is principal component analysis on the chapters of several specified Chinese texts. The thing I want to highlight about the program itself, though, is that it starts out again simply by specifying a list of texts. And these are specified, again, using these machine-readable textual identifiers, or URNs. Uh, and then we have various functions within the code which request data from the API, and also, in this case, request metadata from the API. And this particular program is designed to to construct vectors on the basis of the data it gets and to plot principal component analysis chart of the information. So in this case, uh, this particular example is used for investigating features of authorial language use for the purpose, purposes of authorship attribution. So the, uh, each individual dot on this particular graph represents one chapter of one text and the coloring represents different texts which are labeled uh, at the top right. So all of the data in this chart has actually been obtained through the API. All of these chapters have been downloaded from it, but so is the metadata. So the actual legend for this graph also has been extracted from the API using this list of URNs. And what that means is that if we change the URNs, everything in this chart also changes in exactly the same way we would expect it to. So this makes it very easy for people to experiment with this kind of program 
In fact, to experiment with this type of program, you wouldn't even have to understand any of the details of the program itself, other than the very first line, which specifies a list of URNs. If you change those URNs to different URNs, you'll get exactly the kind of result that you'll expect from this. And this is something which is very intuitive and makes it very easy to work with relatively complex techniques in a classroom environment where we don't have a huge amounts of teaching time. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, there's a lot, a lot more information about this available online, and all of these links are in English. The, the site itself has a complete English user interface, uh, as well as a Chinese one, and it's open access. So if you're interested, please uh, go online and play around. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to take the first couple of questions while we are recording. So make sure to speak loudly or come around so the microphone can pick you up. And then we're going to stop the recording uh, but continue the, the discussion. And I have a couple of questions, but maybe start with somebody else first. Sorry. Thank you. Um, thanks for a great talk. Uh, an unusual topic for this seminar series. I'm very impressed by your user numbers. 25,000 per day. Um, do you, could you break that down into, are we talking about people that are um, editing, contributing to it, or people who are um, making use of it for a scholarly resource? And the second part of the question, excuse me, forgive me, is do you get a sense of what it's being used for for scholarly purposes? Right, thanks. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, First of all, so, so first of all, the simple, simplest answer to that is no, 25,000, those are people who are using this in any capacity at all. So most, most users are going to be casual users. They're, the majority are not going to be editing this. Um, the number of people who actually do editing is fairly limited. Although it is open in the sense that Wikipedia is open, anyone can edit it, it does require that users create a free account. So that's a small sort of hurdle which will stop some people from editing it. Um, in practice, at the moment, we only have about 8,000 user accounts, so that's the number of people who, who edit this project at the moment. Um, in terms of the split between academia and outside of academia, I don't have good data on that, but my impression is that the majority of users as a whole will be based outside of academia. Um, as I say, I don't have good evidence for that other than that this seems like too large a number for them all to be based uh, in universities. The, the, the feedback box at the bottom. If, yeah. you, if you use our product, how do you use it and did you recommend it to your friends? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually very interested in doing user studies in the future, but so far there haven't really been any. Um, the, the only data I have at the moment is from Google Analytics. I was, I was very interested in your process for adding rare characters. <laughs> um, and the, the question I have about it is probably entirely motivated by ignorance of how Ch Chinese writing system works. Um, but so you talk about how you, um, you annotate this rare character, you, you create an, a black and white image of it, which can then be used as a glyph for right, it right. elsewhere. Um, and you attach various metadata to that. Um, and that character can then be searched within the corpus in the same right. way any other character can using its identifier. Right. Um, I was wondering, given the, among the metadata you produced was the composition of that character, can you also search for these special characters by yes. all the elements of the composition or some of the elements of the composition? Um, yes, so at the moment you certainly can for cases like these which are very common where it's composed of two components. Um, the actual search functionality for that probably needs to be improved, but yes, one of the one of the most common ways to search for these things is going to be by composition. And part of the motivation for that is that people who are searching for these characters in Unicode are also likely to be using the same methodology, because if these are rare characters, it is likely to be completely obscure what the reading of them is going to be. So the logical way to input them is using their components. So yes, a lot of the motivation for having that in the metadata is to make it searchable. Is there another mechanism for combining characters in, in Unicode? No. Um, no, there isn't a way for actually combining them into a into a glyph from Chinese. Uh, there are special codes for representing the combination of characters, uh, but these are not for the purposes of creating something that would be rendered by any actual font. Sure. 